Okay. Back is... Yeah. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone. This here looks like the dedicated crew for the Goldfish Show. Thank you so much for making it down here. I've uh, I've never been asked to uh, speak about my ranchu in this kind of way, so this is really a treat for me. <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, Jeff Thompson. I live up in Bend, Oregon. Uh, let's see, I guess uh, I needed to work on the contrast a little bit. My uh, Instagram uh, handle is at j.thompson.ranchu. And then uh, Next one's really hard to read, but I have a blog, which is the ranchunotes.blogspot.com, and those are kind of the, the ways I put my information out there. So if you're on Instagram, please uh, contact me through there. Get a hold of me through there. That's uh, I really enjoy getting to... Uh, I've met several people this weekend who... Uh, it's been interesting to put faces with names, and uh, I really enjoy that. So. It's easy sometimes to just hide out in Oregon, so this has been a fun opportunity to just uh, get out there. <laughs> yeah, so Bend, Oregon. There we have the uh, the state. If you kind of drew a an X through the state, Bend's kind of right in the middle. Um, the western part of Oregon is forested and lush, you know. Uh, a lot of uh, farming and uh, vegetation. Where I'm at, Eastern Oregon, it's the high desert. It's uh, 3,500 to 4,000 foot elevation, sagebrush, uh, deserts, the forest, but you know, rivers and mountains. So uh, much different than most people think about Oregon as. But uh, you know, I love it out there. We have four really strong seasons. Uh, powerful winter and a short spring and a nice summer and uh, it's just a, it's a really nice place to call home so this page is titled uh, saw my first ranchu uh, and this is the fancy goldfish book I imagine a lot of people here are familiar with this book um, it's currently it's out of print right now uh, you can only find it as you really uh, in-depth uh, medical and medicine type of chapters, but then further back in the book, I was just captivated by the sections about Japanese ranchu and uh, the arts surrounding goldfish and ranchu in Japan and Asia. I am a, by profession, I am an artist. I have a uh, glass blowing studio in Bend. So I create sculptures and artworks uh, for galleries and collectors. And I really found my eye drawn to the artistic nature of Ranchu. And motivated by, you know, the chapters in this book. So if you don't have this book, I recommend it to anyone with uh, interest in goldfish. So, prompted by my fascination of the ranchu, the lack of the dorsal fin, and just kind of the, just being amazed by the images in the fancy goldfish book, I pursued genuine Japanese ranchu in 2006. And, uh, let's see, Gary, you know uh, Neo Ranchu, Steve Carney, was, right. he was uh, really, uh, pivotal in being able to bring genuine Japanese ranchu into the United States and uh, so I started I just jumped in with both feet and got some really good quality stock from Mr. Oishi and through Neo Ranchu and also received a uh, an adult I actually uh, this is one of the glass sculptures. I uh, gifted a sculpture to Mr. Oishi. And, uh, 
that prompted him to then in return he gifted me this amazing uh, ranchu, just a specimen quality fish. And uh, that was uh, really, really a special treat for me. Um, my, uh, I wish at that time my goldfish keeping skills were a little bit better because I was not able to uh, breed with that male. And well, that's just how it goes sometimes. And it actually took me, uh, I had been keeping Ranchu for six years before I was able to advance my skills enough to take a spawn. <laughs> So uh, this is dated 2006, that's when I received the, the young ones and the adult, and then I just skipped forward to kind of show uh, how they progressed. And they grew into some very, very beautiful, beautiful fish, but it was also a, a learning curve for me of jumping into the traditional Japanese method of keeping ranchu, which is different because this style uses no filtration of any type. And this is completely a foreign idea uh, for a lot of Westerners and Americans. Uh, I think a lot of times we want to use a formula of trying to get hundreds potentially of gallons a minute or however it's calculated, just large volumes of filtration running through. This is not the way these grandmasters in Japan are doing it. They're doing it with an air stone only, but what happens is they have a secondary pond that has no fish in it. It just has the water in it. After several days go by and a water change is needed, the fish are just moved into the fresh pond. Then the old pond is drained and rinsed and refilled and is ready for after several more days go by, it, then they can get switched back and forth like that. So uh, these are the instructions that came with the little baby Ranju from Mr. Oishi. It's kind of intimidating to, you know, pay many hundreds of dollars for some fish and just get these kind of, you know, eight bullet points of what needs to happen for them. But uh, the, the real crux of this instruction sheet is uh, point number six. He recommends 100% water changes, essentially moving them to a new container every four to seven days. Um, during the first few days in the fresh water, the baby Ranju will put on body growth. And then during the last few days before the water change, as the water is less fresh, they put on the head growth. And so we're kind of sculpting the fish in this way of using the fresh water turning to, and it's not dirty, we you know with stocking levels and stocking feeding levels, the water is not foul, but it's not the pristine crystal clear water after several days go by. So this change in the water quality is uh, actually a tool that we use for sculpting the body and then the head of these. And these are, I definitely consider these living artworks and uh, I draw upon my artistic sensibilities with look how I look at them and grade them and also try to build their features. Um, so these instructions are on my blog. If anyone would like to uh, look at that Ranchu Notes blog spot, you can see the uh, full list of information from Mr. Oishi. And then, uh, you know, looking at, these are uh, Mr. Oishi's own fish belonging to him in Japan that he used as the breeders for the 20, uh, the 2006 spawn that I received fish from. And uh, it's interesting to see some of the different characteristics. And 
you know, in the bottom right, we've got a nice big round body, and above that, there's more of a sleeker body. Sometimes these can indicate female or male, sometimes not. Sometimes uh, different, you know, when we think of the females, we oftentimes think that they have the more rotund body. Yes, sometimes that's true, but they, they're just like art, they're allowed to break the mold too, so that's not necessarily a perfect indicator. But then also, uh, you know, I haven't looked at these pictures in years, and it was a lot of fun to go through some of my archive stuff, and in the middle bottom, uh, I can see that there is actually some ammonia burn on uh, the, the tail fin a little bit. And, that makes me understand that, uh, you know, even these grandmasters in Japan are still just people too, and maybe the water change timing wasn't exactly right, um, and so if you let them stay in the dirty water a little bit too long, yes, we may have some ammonia burns. That is uh, not real problematic. That will just heal uh, in short order by going into fresh water, but you know, looking back on this stuff, it made me uh, see uh, Mr. Oishi as a person and a keeper just like us too. And because uh, it's for me, it's really easy to ho hold these grandmasters in very high regard because I have, you know, a lot of respect and admiration for uh, what they're doing with the Ranchu in Japan. Uh, so these are some photos of uh, Mr. Oishi and his setup. Uh, Mr. Oishi is deceased now, uh, but these are back from when he was uh, uh, still keeping Ranchu. And we can see that he's got his, uh, you know, outdoor ponds with the, it, we need protection from the sun as well as protection from predators. And, uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot to be learned by just simply observing some of these uh, setups and the way they organize things. And so I'm very glad to be able to have uh, had these as part of my uh, learning experience of getting fish from him. Uh, these are uh, older. I found these photos online. Uh, I think they're about 2012 interesting to see how his own fish evolved. I see uh, on the right in the middle super amazing Ranchu. Uh, so even in a six year period for Mr. Oishi I feel like even he had some really amazing progressions as far as what I assume he was going for in his own uh, Ranchu. So uh, I was able to uh, keep the, the Ranchu for seven years is how long the longest one of them uh, lived for me, and, which I feel good about for with the learning curve of uh, getting to know the method of the 100% water changes. It's, uh, it's about looking at the water, touching the water, smelling the water, observing the behavior of the ranchu, um, which is divergent from the test kit method we would use of a more scientific approach of monitoring our water quality. So it's much more of a artistic type of approach to try to understand the more tactile qualities of the water and uh, it's there is a learning curve with that and it takes time to get used to but I um, encourage anyone to try a 100% water change method if you have the space and the room to have separate ponds um, I am going to go out on a limb here and say that I think all goldfish will thrive with this style of keeping. Um, I started with, uh, on the left there, you can see these are stock tanks that you get from the feed store for the, what the, where the farmers shop. Um, not really ideally 
not the ideal dimensions uh, for Ranchu uh, because they're a little bit deep. So when we only fill a pond like this to uh, 10 or 12 inches deep of water, well, you've got 10 or 12 inches that's empty, so you're not really utilizing the full amount of space, but uh, they still can be workable to start off with. And then, uh, yeah, I have some of the mature fish from him, and uh, you know, these are often in Western societies, they're called top view ranchu. Um, I'm not quite sure where that term came from. I have been moving away from using that term at all because they are Japanese ranchu, and the grading system they use actually evaluates them from all angles, the top, the side, and even the bottom of the fish is a significant, significant consideration when looking underneath the tail and things. Um, so, I appreciate the term Japanese around you. So, yeah, I want to talk about some inspirations and influences. Uh, Jurt Coppens is uh, a fella from Belgium that was uh, active in kind of providing some good advice to the Americans back in the day and seeing his, uh, you know, very clean nice type of setup and uh, you can see that it doesn't necessarily take a ton of space to raise some good batches of ranchu and have some spawns um, but it was uh, you know it takes a lot I think it takes a lot of effort to uh, get on the internet and provide information to up-and-coming hobbyists and I really appreciate his efforts in trying to spread the knowledge and spread skills on Ranchu. And that's him in Japan. He's visited many of the grandmasters in Japan. So he wrote uh, the Standard of Perfection, which I'll show on the next page, um, which uh, for me it's uh, difficult to take a visual element such as a ranchu and break down the forms into written word. Um, so I've adapted his standard of perfection to a photo of the fish I received from Mr. Oishi. So, you know, we have uh, appearance, balance between head, body, and tail. Swim in a powerful and elegant manner. Movements should look easy and beautiful. Um, the back should be wide. Scale should be small and well arranged. From the side, the line of the back should be perfectly curved. Fin should be small. And then some more technical things, 45 degree angle between the tail and the body. And, uh, then some terms for some of the different parts of the body, you know, the uh, oshia, the tail shoulders, ocean, the tail core, uh, ozara, the underside of the oza, which the oza is the bracelet, is the last scales on the tail before. These are components that are really looked at carefully uh, in Japan when they're judging fish and things that we should also look carefully at on our ranchu. Um, misaka, the distance from eyes to the mouth. We want a nice long distance. The mihaba, we want the eyes to be very wide. Um, and even in the very, very young fish, I'm looking for these kind of features to pick the best ones that I want to move forward with. Um, this is also on my blog if anyone would like to take a closer look. Okay, now I'm going to read all the words on, no, I'm not going to read all the words on this page, but this is uh, Gert's full standard of perfection. Um, very detailed about all the different components. Currently, this is the uh, top post on my blog, the Ranchu, no uh, Ranchu Notes uh, blogspot.com, Ranchu Notes dot blogspot.com. So if anyone would like to take a more in-depth reading of this, I uh, welcome you to see that on the blog. 
So breaking down that standard of perfection, uh, you know, as an artist, I am more of a visual type of a learner rather than maybe just a textbook type of a learner. So I broke down uh, the features of how I see the Ranchu. And so the one on the top left is illustrating the very thick backbone. Then looking at kind of some of the geometric components of the parts of the fish. Um, then on the right there is uh, a one to four ratio. I prefer there's a one to four or a one to three ratio or kind of the standards for Ranchu. So I like the one to four is what that is illustrating. So to me, that means a long body Ranchu. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. Um, and then kind of this ideal tail curve kind of a shape. And then, uh, you know, thinking about being a visual learner and the artistic nature, I found the Simpsons uh, clip where Marge was doing art and the way she would see the components is by breaking it down into simple shapes. So I really enjoy looking at the Ranchu as a, co as a conglomeration of these different geometric shapes. Uh, Richard Lim from Singapore is very handy to have uh, Facebook and online friends in Singapore because they have a close connection to, uh, well, some of them have a close connection to Japan, but they speak in type English, so it is a really good uh, intermediary to be able to get information from Japan. And, you know, 10 years ago and 12, 13 years ago, the uh, Japanese were really not online. Right? Now there is a lot more information about goldfish and ranchu coming out of Japan, but years ago it was it was pretty vacant in that department. So, uh, you know, Richard is at uh, Ranchu Kitsliano uh, dot dot com. Um, he's not blogging very actively right now, but it is a great resource to go through and check out the articles that he has done. Um, this is Richard on the left um, with a friend, and then uh, Akira Sakurai is uh, to the right of the friend, um, renowned breeder in Japan, and also uh, known to be a very friendly and helpful individual at the Ranchu. And then to the right of that is uh, Boss Ranchu in Thailand, who does a lot with uh, Japanese Ranchu as well. Okay, so 2011, this is when stuff really started to pick up with Japanese ranchu in the United States here. There was a, a big import and a lot of us passionate ranchu keepers were able to get a hold of this specific line of ranchu to work with. And uh, it was a lot of fun to have, you know, the. Uh, there must have been you know, 8 or 10 or 12 of us across the United States that all got the opportunity to receive uh, the babies like you see up in the uh, upper left there and try our hand at raising them together and that working as uh, a loose-knit group like that you have an opportunity to kind of compare and see and uh, Boosting the growth rate early on is very important, so when you have a group of people, you can kind of compare our mine behind or mine ahead, and it's just a good uh, benchmark to kind of see how you're doing with uh, other people who are working with the same age and the same group of fish. So in 2011, I built my first uh, purpose-built greenhouse to keep the ranchu in. Ranchu thrive when they are kept with the seasons. This means that they experience a winter hibernation. The, the proper term is not hibernation. Hibernation is a word that describes a specific biological process in mammals. 
Um, so we can say things like a winter cool down or a dormancy period, but when the winter is cold, the ranchu water it cools off. The ranchu are not fed for potentially many weeks or a couple of months at a time. Then when the sunlight comes back in the spring and the temperatures warm up, their natural spawning response is triggered. And oh man, it is a strong response. So keeping them in the greenhouse with the seasons was uh, really the uh, really the catalyst for me starting to have success. And then also the, the Goldfish Keepers Forum. Has, every, has anyone been on the Goldfish? I'm sure most of us out here have been on the Goldfish Forum. Um, and that was put together by Tung Tung Nguyen. And this was a really important online forum for the people with those SK Ranchu to connect with each other and this was uh, I really appreciate the effort that uh, him and many others put into the forum and that was a good catalyst for Ranchu in America it was a little bit of a springboard for our communication and uh, starting to make make Ranchu more of a reality in the United States although we're still still a niche group but I like that I like the like specialty kind of stuff so uh, this is a view of the inside of the first greenhouse. This is a 12 foot by 30 foot footprint. And you can see all the stock tanks on the left hand side. And then I started using some of those uh, kitty pools. Those are a five foot kitty pool. That is cheap. That is a cheap, cheap way to store 90 gallons of water. The kiddie pool is also a more appropriate dimension of water for the ranchu because it's not so deep as the stock tanks want to be. Um, they, the kiddie pools that have the cartoon Nemos and fish <laughs> printed on the bottom. And it's good for getting laughed at when, you know, relatives are visiting the fish <laughs> house and, oh, you have goldfish? Oh, you've got kid pools? And, uh, so not a lot of esteem to be had by the kiddie pools, but man, they work good. Man, they are cheap. They're so easy to scrub down. Um, I justify the purchasing of them, hoping that they will last a couple of years and thinking that the 15 or $19 that I spent will have uh, you know, paid dividends if I get two years out of them. Those things last and last and last. I've had them, I've had some for six years. So uh, just a really appropriate size uh, of uh, water volume for the ranchu. So 2012, my first spawn ever as a result of having the ranchu live with the seasons. Um, a little bit hard to see, but there's fry in that upper left corner. Um, then uh, some growth progress, and then the colored baby ranchu. And then in 2012, the American Ranchu Society was gifted this logo by Kendall Little in Utah. He was part of the group growing out the baby ranchu also happens to be a graphic designer so he came up with this and actually uh, my understanding is that he won a couple of awards in the graphic design field for this design um, then just to the right of that you can see the glass medallions that i make i uh, adapted his uh, logo into a, I was able to create a sandblast resist that I used the sandblast resist on graphite and now I have a graphite stamp that allows me to stamp out these uh, little medallions and those have been a ton of fun for club members and I send one of the medallions out with whenever I send someone uh, a box of fish and it's just uh, you know a good little camaraderie kind of thing. And I really appreciate uh, Kendall's uh, 
design on that. And then uh, these are some of my favorite ones, you know, when you're working with a big spawn of Ronchu, you're always looking for the best ones in the group, and then those are going to be the ones you want to use as the next generation. Uh, 2013, this is the first year I made, I built my own purpose-built Ranchu ponds. Um, so these are made with uh, 2x12 lumber and plywood and, uh, you know, 2x4s around the top rim. And then it's got a pond line, a heavy-duty pond liner lining the inside of the pond with a, with a drain on the on the bottom, uh, and then I stain them with a heavy duty fence stain. So I built, uh, on the right there, there's two six by six ponds. They have the ability to hold about 18 inches of water, but the ranchu are gonna thrive best. Uh, adult ranchu, I keep in about 12 inches of water, but sometimes it's nice to have the versatility to hold more water if I want to use it as a holding tank to maybe fill more ponds or you know who knows what the situation is but in this case uh, I built the six by sixes at 18 inches deep and then uh, on the left uh, top you can see I'm working on a that's a six by twelve uh, that's a big one that holds about about 600 gallons at 12 inches depth and uh, the, these have turned out to be real workhorses and I mean, right now today these exact ponds are being importantly utilized in my greenhouse and my operation so it's uh it's a bit of an investment to put forth, you know, several hundred dollars of the lumber and the pond liner, but man, they are bulletproof. They just last and last and last. I would encourage anyone with an interest in Ranchu to uh, build some really tough, high-quality ponds for them. Uh, so here is some of the Ranchu from the 2013 season. Uh, yeah, a lemon head with just a couple of spots of red. So striking, such an amazing fish. Lemon head with the spots on the back and that you know, red rim. I just, as, a, as an artist, I am constantly surprised and amazed by the different patterns that emerge and the different forms of the ranchu. And uh, uh, that, the one on the bottom right ended up turning nearly all white and so there's kind of some surprises to be had on how they uh, grow up and evolve. Uh, let's see, the 24-14 season, I've got the big ponds uh, outside of the greenhouse. I've moved up to using many more of the, of the blue kitty pools, but also still using the stock tanks as uh, mostly as hatching tanks and for uh, very little ranchu because I'm only filling them five or six inches deep of water. Um, so they were still working okay for fry and stuff. Um, then also, uh, this is a blend I had uh, in 2013, I had one Mr. Oishi ranchu left, a male, and I was able to blend it with the SK line that I that all the different ranchu keepers had received. These are some of the prime uh, fish from that combination. Um, it went good one time. I uh, this was a real learning experience. I think that uh, <laughs> compatibility between breeding, you, picking a male and a female, they need to be extraordinarily closely related especially for the long-term viability of the line that's created. Uh, the Oishi combined with the SK line worked okay one time. The original cross did okay. And then the next generation, I'm 
have learned is when problems begin to emerge on non-compatible crosses. So after that one first cross, then trying to do it the second time, it is not a fun feeling to have an entire spawn of Ranchu or a couple spawns of Ranchu with not one single fry that can be moved forward to grow into a baby black ranchu. Because it's even a lot of work to spend, you know, two, three, four weeks raising a batch of eggs and a batch of fry to get a big zero. It's tough. And so this is maybe one of the difficulties we have uh, trying to, you know, chart our own course in the United States because I bet in the clubs in Japan the very first thing they would explain is that how closely related the mothers and fathers need to be to avoid this exact uh, situation that I encountered but uh, you know it's the school of hard knocks and I'm not afraid of a little bit of hard work so Ranchu taught me that lesson, that's for sure. Okay, so more of uh, 2014 here. I've uh, built a, you know, just a rudimentary workstation in the greenhouse, so I have a place to sit and sort through the Ranchu, and it is sometimes takes one, two, or three days for me to sort through an entire batch of fry the first time. So uh, it's spend a lot of time sitting at the sitting at the desk in the greenhouse um, a couple of illustrations about some simple problems uh, the split oza um, so here you can see uh, on the bottom an acceptable oza a good one that's the break the bracelet of the scales uh, the last scales before the tail fin begins and when that is split, it is a, it is a major fault. It, uh, the split Oza can absolutely not move forward in any capacity. That, those will be abandoned. Um, the backbone curvature, here we come in again with uh, why that term top view is just not working for me because we're really grading the way the backbone works, and then I have some different degrees of why the, well, the ones that are uh, problematic. And when the backbone kind of goes like this, or is a saddleback, um, major fault. Don't want to invest any more resources in moving forward those kind of uh, those kind of round two. And then uh, you know some just nice uh, progression pics of how the how they evolve to be uh, tosai eventually. And it is a fun process to get them to the age where they're finally gonna start to color in and see uh, if you hit the jackpot and got really cool colors. <laughs> Uh, so in 2014, I wrote a bit of an article for the American Goldfish Association newsletter, uh, now defunct, has been replaced by the, uh, the Greater and Mightier Goldfish Council. So uh, back in these days, there was kind of some evolution of exactly how the American clubs were being put together and administered. but. Uh, Gary and Josh and Rob, you guys have nailed it this time. So congratulations Thank on you. getting where where the club has been. Um, so this is also on my blog. I speak a little bit about uh, you know the art that I see in Ranchu, how I find Ranchu to be a relaxing lifestyle. It's for me, it is a meditation of pleasing patterns, both daily and seasonally. One of the things that keeps me going in Ranchu is kind of that seasonal change, you know? In the winter, gosh darn it, I need a break. I'm glad for the slowdown in the greenhouse. And then uh, the anticipation builds, and then when the spawning starts happening, I'm happy for that time of year. And then in the summer, I'm excited to see the, uh, 
the colors come in on the baby fish. And then in the fall, it's nice to see them really fill out and get full. And uh, by then, I'm uh, ready for a break again. So thank goodness for the four seasons. <laughs> Okay, so 2015, I, um, this was a big year. I imported groups of Japanese ranchu from breeders in Thailand and from breeders in Japan. Um, this was a huge year uh, and actually uh, the results of the Japanese fish are directly visible in the show bowls here at the show with the, uh, uh, thank you Rob, the grand champion of the show is a result of this import in 2015. Um, I also took a step forward and built more purpose-built ponds. These with the blue liner are 5x5 five five, and I restricted the depth to 11 inches to uh, make sure I, uh, you know, I had to, I was making sure that I would not uh, push the depth limits of the water. The, uh, the deeper the water gets for Japanese ranchu, it provides more water pressure on the t leading edge of the tail fin. And what we want is a big, beautiful tail. So by having more shallow water, there's less water pressure uh, trying to pull that tail back, trying to collapse the tail. So that's why we're using shallow water. Um, the Thailand fish uh, was a difficult road. Um, I have the strong winters. The Thai, the Japanese ranchu from Thailand did not like the winters. They did not like when I was withholding food to prepare them for the cold winters. They matured extraordinarily quickly. As tosai, they spawn seven, eight, nine times. And a general rule is that you're not really supposed to take eggs from tosai. You're supposed to at least wait till nisai, and it's a pretty standard rule to wait until they are oya, which would be in their third year. Um, so I think what I, the conclusion I've come to is that the tropical nature of Thailand has brought on a faster life cycle. Um, so by the time they were Nisai, they spawned twice, and I think they had darn run out of eggs. So there were multiple things going on with the Thai strains of Ranchu that just was not compatible with my situation. The ones from Japan are much more um, amenable to the colder winters and to not eating for a period of time through the year. And again, another one of those trial by fire kind of situations where you just kind of had to learn it by doing it. And then, uh, you know, we did have some eggs that year as well. Um, I went ahead and I built five of those five by five ponds and today, this exact day, these are in use in my greenhouse. They are filled with uh, uh, fry and baby ranchu and uh, just again want to re reiterate that anyone with a passion for Japanese ranchu should not hesitate to go ahead and frame out some ponds and line it with a uh, pond liner and Joshua I think uh, later today you're gonna touch on that a little bit too <laughs> All right. so. Nikolai Balkos he raised the greatest one of the SK line that I've ever seen uh, it is I rely on having skilled keepers to send my baby Ronchu to, and when someone gets, you know, five or ten or however many they get from me, they have an extraordinary opportunity to 
really focus on that group and boost that group with really heightened care and heightened levels of food and uh, you know, his ranchu really shows out. You know, I'm, I'm keeping you know, dozens and dozens of baby fish, and so it, it's, it's just extraordinarily difficult sometimes to really focus in on the level of care that uh, some of the uh, people I send fish to. They can really get them to grow awesome, and uh, Nikolai did that in 2015. Really admire that. Uh, some of the uh, Oishi crosses continuing to grow. Some great color patterns out of the SK line. And, uh, you know, my understanding is that in Japan there is less uh, importance paid upon the patterning and the coloring. I mean, they want deep color, but the, the, whether it's uh, all white or red and white is less significant uh, in Japan. But for me, that is something that I really enjoy is the dynamic color patterns. And so I picked out a, a photo that really showed some of the diversity that came through on that particular line. Okay, 2016 is uh, this slide. This was my first opportunity to work with the new Japanese imports and wow yeah that was a very productive year I've got amazing ranchu and uh, the the Oya and the grand champion at the show here today are from this exact spawn in 2016 so um, one of the, my understanding is that one of the challenges in Japan is not only to have a young fish that looks good, but that continues to look good as the years go by, a really big challenge. And so I uh, was very pleased to bring some of these uh, older fish and to uh, share them at the show. And it's easy to hide out in Oregon where only I get to enjoy the fish, and sometimes that's okay, but I'm glad to get to bring them out and uh, share them with all of you. More of the 2016. Again, looking at the way the, the baby ranchu on the top there. Extraordinarily important with how the top curve is in relation to the bottom curve. We're really looking for a uh, symmetrical kind of a look. Um, over on the right, uh, you can see a uh, really powerful baby ranchu or Kuroko. And then below that is the exact same fish just uh, a month later, and that's how the color pattern came in. Um, now on the bottom left here, this is the exact fish that was the grand champion winner of the show as a tosai. And when I'm talking about that one to four body ratio from the illustration earlier with the boxes around the, uh, showing the one to four proportion, um, this is why it's important for me because this longer body is going to provide the foundation for years down the road to support the larger head. Also on these young tosai, I'm not necessarily always looking for the craziest, largest head, um, but I want a foundation for very good head growth in the future and yes I like a dynamic head on the young fish but also with the understanding that three years or more down the line this long robust body is going to provide the stability for the large head. Um, a, a worst case scenario would be a head becoming so large that the ranchu is not sitting balanced in the water and so uh, it's uh, I'm glad I put forth the efforts to record uh, some of this stuff uh, so detailed back in the day and fun to be able to uh, see uh, how the growth progressed and how these fish progressed because uh, the photography and the images really helped me remember what 
the heck was going on back there, back then. Okay, so uh, 2016, I started doing Instagram. Instagram is a ton of fun for me. Instagram is a great way for me to just do simple daily type of updates on what's going on in the greenhouse and what's going on with the operation I've got going on. So. Uh, I, again, I encourage anyone that's got an interest in uh, my operation here to contact me on Instagram. I think uh, a lot of you uh, are, we are already connected on Instagram, so thank you for that. And uh, I always enjoy your comments, and it's, uh, you know, when I'm hiding out in Oregon, it's nice to get some feedback and to hear what's going on with other people. So. Um, you know, the website kind of stuff takes a uh, concentrated effort to make updates and get things uploaded and changed, and the Instagram is instant, so it's just been a really easy way for me to uh, put my ranchu out there. I've been really enjoying the Instagramming. So 2017 is this year. You can see I've got the 5 by 5s all rolling. Still using the stock tanks for hatching uh, fry and raising fry for a couple of weeks. Um, 2017, really feeling the groove with my methods. I'm using the brine shrimp eggs for the fry. One, one of the best, uh, easiest foods to really boost the fry is the uh, fresh hatch, hatch brine shrimp. Uh, the Hikari frozen blood worms. That is the only brand of blood worms that I like to use. I have done comparisons with some of the other brands and melted them out and really compared and other brands seem to have uh, dirtier water, more white or discolored worms. Um, so the Hikari is just, I just don't try anything else. I just use those. Um, with the foods, I'm using the Azayaka food and the Japan Ranchu Lord uh, Type D. Type D is indicating the size of the pellet. Um, the Azayaka, I tend to use the blue bag. Um, that's for the younger fish. Uh, is uh, the growth formula. Uh, I have used the green bag for the adults. That's considered the balance formula. Uh, then the purple bag is the color enhancing with spirulina. Definitely use that from time to time. But uh, I tend to get really good coloring in my ranchu from all the algae growing in the ponds. They eat a lot of that. So the algae growing is a super important food source critical for the ranchu. Uh, it is a high water content food. It is going to keep the dense pellet foods moving through the system. Uh, the algae is going to help improve the color of the fish. The algae is also going to help with the water quality of the water sump. Um, the Japan Ranchu Lord is a little bit more of a cereal based, uh, has a, more of a wheat or a grain component in it. I don't necessarily want to use that exclusively, but it is a great addition to the Azayaka. Um, so I, these, are the, these are the foods I recommend. Uh, yeah, so more of 2017. So I. I uh, use Instagram to announce when I have fish available. And so people who are interested in finding out information about that can tune into Instagram and I'll usually post one of these uh, symbols. This is the uh, that tree symbol uh, is from the Cascadia chapter of the Ranchu Society that I was running. Kendall uh, designed that for me, that's called a mon, a Japanese mon is the term for this symbol, this style of symbol, and uh, that was really an honor for him to uh, design one specifically for me. I enjoy using that to, uh, to announce when people can go and check out what, what's currently available. 
I don't always have things available. It's uh, seasonal, and sometimes I have the babies available, sometimes not. Well, oftentimes not. It's uh, just in certain times of the year. Sometimes I have adult ranchu available, sometimes not. So just announcing on Instagram is a good way to put it out there that there's something to go check out on the blog. Um, let's see, then I've got, uh, you know, just some updates on some of the different, uh, different fish I'm working with. Let's see, here in the middle and the bottom, these are, uh, from the 2016 spawn and also so in the left of that group is uh, is the fish we see back here in the in the bowl 2018 this was a year of big changes is what I've titled this page um, so I tore down my 12 by 30 greenhouse and I built a 26 by 70 foot greenhouse that's dedicated for the ranchu. It's about 1,800 square feet. It's uh, it's a monster. Um, I knew that in the middle of the winter I could get a screaming deal on a used greenhouse on Craigslist, and I did. And it was snowy out and no one's thinking about greenhouses when it's in the middle of the winter so I wish I could make all my uh, plans as strategic as that but I knew that I would be able to uh, really find a screaming deal so uh, this has uh, has a uh, BTL liner they're a company that makes uh, pond liners and now greenhouse uh, fabrics. Uh, this is a woven uh, 12 mil, extraordinarily heavy duty. Uh, so uh, I also, it was, uh, it was enough greenhouse parts to make a 26 by 100 foot greenhouse. Well, I only had room to put up a 70 foot greenhouse. Well, I did not just throw out those extra hoops uh, you know normally a greenhouse like this would have five foot spacing between each hoop I just shrunk it down to three and a half foot spacing to increase the strength and then added extra purlins because there was enough straight metal for purlins for a hundred foot greenhouse those are the straight ones running the length of it so I just stacked them up and added more and just really wanting to increase the strength because of our potential in Central Oregon for snowfall. Uh, not every winter do we get significant snowfall, but sometimes we do and sometimes it's a lot. Let's see, uh, oh, okay, so I uh, used the wood from the previous greenhouse. I dismantled the previous greenhouse, stained it all and got the wood looking all nice and used that lumber, reused the lumber as the end walls of the greenhouse. So uh, really was able to just do this whole project on the cheap by having the good timing of the purchase in the winter, reusing some materials and uh, then uh, purchasing that uh, greenhouse cover locally, avoided shipping costs on an expensive, uh, heavy, bulky item. Also used the reused lumber to make a new and improved, bigger uh, workbench in the, in the greenhouse. And uh, well, have just uh, been using that uh, just the day before I came here. So that's, the, that's my current workbench. I've got a light rail on there so I can point uh, spotlight into whatever bowls I happen to be working on. Um, and then that's the uh, view of the, of the greenhouse last year. Uh, I've got all my purpose-built ponds over on the right-hand side there. And then I've been using the round kiddie pools still and also uh, some of the other kind of Intex ponds. Uh, in the back on the left there, those are five by seven Intex ponds. 
great size footprint for adult goldfish. Uh, a little bit deeper than I would want for Ronchu, but there's an easy solution for that. I just don't fill it up all the way. Those ponds at the on sale type of prices, which tend to start to happen, summer stuff goes on sale uh, end of July oftentimes. Those ponds can be purchased for less than it costs to buy a liner to go into a purpose-built pond. So uh, those are an extraordinarily inexpensive way to get a huge volume of water for the goldfish. Um, here in the front you can see this is the 4x4 Intex uh, kiddie pool. This uses a very thin and fragile liner. Uh, not very durable, but when you bump up to the dark, the larger Intex pools that uh, have the darker blue, that is a triple ply liner, much more heavy duty, much better peace of mind for uh, keeping fish in. Um, and then I was, uh, last year I was using the old fish water to grow tomato plants and oh man, they love that. Those things grew, grew, everyone must have been nine feet tall before they started to kind of collapse back down over. But uh, great way to reuse the old fish water is doing a little gardening. Uh, okay, so more from 2018. Um, the two fish on the left are here at the Goldfish Council <coughs> show right now. Um, the one on the right, uh, uh, an outstanding fish, but as the years have gone by, it's balance, he kind of sits a little nose forward in the water. The balance isn't quite as perfect as I might hope for, so that one just uh, didn't quite make the trip down here, although the color pattern is just uh, really amazing on that one. Um, having some fun, you know, doing some underwater photography with the fish, and uh, again, appreciating how the side view is also important in Japanese rock show. Twenty eighteen, more from that. Last year. <coughs> Lots of spawns. Lots of really good eggs. Uh, you know it's it's a lot of work to raise uh, baby Ronchu and to take good care of the eggs, but uh, you know, I'm I'm passionate about it and I'm not afraid of a challenge, so it's uh, it really works for, I guess, my personality type to uh, you know, delve into a rabbit hole such as breeding run <laughs> More of 2018, it was a big year. Ah, when the colors are coming in, that is one of my favorite times of the year, is seeing that transition go on. The bottom right, this one um, was a mother this year as a Nisai, kind of, this is it as a Tosai, kind of uh, broke some rules by using a Nisai as a, as a mother fish, and boy, it paid off. That was, uh, that worked in 2016, and then it worked this year as well. So I think it's important sometimes to, yes, pay attention to the guidelines we're given, but also not be afraid to experiment. And yes, I have, I have been enjoying taking eggs from uh, the Nisai age uh, fish for sure. Okay, so last year, 2018, I was uh, kind of randomly approached by a documentary filmmaker out of Portland, Oregon, and him and his associate have decided to make a documentary film about the Ranchu that I breed. So for the last year, they have been coming to my uh, place there in Bend and filming the Ranchu and interviewing me about it. And man, these guys have a great eye and it is so much fun to see, uh, to see how they see my operation up there. Um, 
I think they've probably been to visit six or seven times and they'll come over for a day or two and um, so lately they've been coming to film the eggs and the fry and uh, last year they were filming more of the of the adult fish and he made it for a visit during the one of the snowstorms and got to watch me shoveling out the greenhouse and stuff and um, I really it's a I'm very honored that they find that my operation is so interesting and I would be looking forward to sharing with you and the rest of the goldfish community the film that they make and uh, it uh, always gets a lot of eye rolls at the family reunion when I explain <laughs> that uh, I am now a movie star. <laughs> I'm going to be a movie star. And they're like, oh boy, here goes Jeff again. <laughs> but uh, it really caught me by surprise, but uh, there's going to be some aspects. You can see me holding those bowls. Those are actually uh, blown glass bowls that I make in my art studio um, because it's so hard to, to get uh, white enamelware bowls. So at one point I was like, well, you know what? I can just make my own. Um, the, the bowls I make have ended up being extraordinarily useful uh, to make some smaller bowls for culling and sorting. The white glass is highly illuminated. It brings a lot of light into the bowl, so um, they are highly functional um, in multiple ways as far as being able to really see well into the bowl. Um, and I enjoy making them, and then also uh, it's going to bring a really interesting fire element into the film they're making with all the heat and motion of the blown glass uh, combined with the water elements and uh, it's just I'm really looking forward to seeing what they put together. So. When, when's the movie coming out? Um, it'll be uh, early 2020 is the current plan. Okay, so here is uh, 2019. First slide for 2019. This was in February. We got a snow dump. It was easily three and possibly up to four feet. Um, so glad that I had built the greenhouse in that beefed up nature. And uh, actually, you can see just behind me on the right hand upper slide there, there's a four by four post going up. Uh, before winter hit, I had actually used a, a 2 by 10 beam across the center of the greenhouse supported by 4 by 4 posts and that was critical because uh, now that one, when once spring came along, you can drive around town and drive around the areas and see greenhouses that collapsed because they, they kind of looked like a taco when the snow pushes down the middle. So uh, I uh, had developed, uh, uh, on the bottom left here, uh, this is actually a long piece of metal with a broom attached to the end. So I needed to make a way to be able to sweep and remove the snow off of the top of the greenhouse. Did not quite get the winter break that I like to have to relax from the ranchu in the winter because I spent a lot of time digging out the greenhouse, making paths through the yard, sweeping the snow off of the top. Um, so I wasn't really, uh, well in the, in the winter I wasn't working hard on the fish, but I ended up working hard on the structure to <laughs> keep it from. <laughs> Okay, so here is some of the breeding stock I used this year. <laughs> Upper left is the exact ranchu you can see in the back, as well the one in the bottom left is also viewable in the bowls back there. Um, as well as, okay, some of the, uh, the other photos have uh, the Nissai 
So those would have been from the 2018 breeding season. And uh, like I said earlier, really happy that I went ahead and used some of those this year. Got some great spawns from both Nissi and Oya this year. Uh, yeah, so I enjoy, one of my favorite types of pictures to post on Instagram is these egg clusters. I use a uh, artificial grass mat for aquariums that's just meant to kind of lay on the bottom of the aquarium. It comes in a 12 inch by 12 inch square. Um, I will cut those into four pieces. Um, that is an extraordinarily great way for collecting the eggs from the girls. Um, when they're laying thousands of eggs you know I definitely anticipate to take two three potentially five thousand eggs from a girl when they spawn um, a lot of when I started out I would just collect all those eggs in a bowl and if the eggs clump or build up too much next to each other or on top of each other that is a no-go. Those eggs will not develop correctly. So by catching them on the grass mats, I, the, I, I, it could probably be calculated the amount of surface area that is contained within all these little fake grass uh, strands. But, uh, you know, you can kind of see by that photo how each egg is really exposed to water on nearly every edge and that's critical for good uh, egg development. Um, the next photo, uh, the eggs are about to hatch. You can see the little eyeballs in there. The blue one, that's a bad egg. I use methylene blue to uh, treat the eggs so that when uh, the eggs that are bad uh, Will develop a fungus. I don't want that fungus spreading to other eggs. Um, the methylene blue is a treatment that uh, halts that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some fry and, uh, and then some baby ranchu. Oh, up there on the upper left, you can see how I have the grass mats in the bowl. Um, some eggs will fall through the, the grass mat, so I still want to catch them in the bowl. I will still hatch those, um, but uh, the grass mats just prevent the clumping. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, on the upper right, that's kind of my uh, sorting situation where I'll, uh, on the left typically are the ones that I'll keep, and the ones in the middle are kind of like a maybe, and the ones on the right are ones that are uh, will not move forward. Okay, so let's see, we're up to current times here. This is this year's spawns. Over on the right, you can see uh, an extraordinary specimen. Uh, seeing baby ranchu that look like this kind of is what makes all of the work worthwhile. I just see so much potential in that and uh, maybe that exact ranchu will be here at the San Jose show in the in the future. Who knows? Maybe it will continue to develop but wow what promise in that. And then uh, you know, I have always uh, am proud to be able to send out baby ranchu to people who want to grow them up themselves. So this is uh, this year's first shipment off of uh, spawn number one. And uh, many thanks at going out to uh, people who like to raise baby ranchu and my baby ranchu. It, it's, uh, it's heartening to have skilled and passionate keepers to send baby ranchu to. I can't Definitely, I cannot raise them all, so I rely on having, uh, you know, dedicated, passionate people to raise some baby ranchu. I'm curious to see how some of these various ones that I don't have room for, how they're going to grow up. And then also when I sell some uh, ranchu, that allows me to buy the top of the, that Azayaka food. I'm bringing that in in, you know, the 10 kilo bags from Japan. And I buy the blood worms 20 pounds at a time. And uh, 
you know, the water bill and the electric bill and all that stuff. So thank you, thank you to everyone. And I appreciate your support. And that's what keeps, uh, keeps me able to make the hobby keep going. <laughs> So this year, we are continuing work on the Ranchu documentary. It's been over a year in progress. Uh, they like to see, uh, you know, they know how to get all the good shots. They love using the ladder, and he likes to get down low. And here we have a progression. They just happened to visit at a time when I had Fry, Baby Ranchu, Nisai, Oya, and uh, uh, Oya plus a year, so uh, fun to get to document uh, all life stages here. And then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a nice little ego boost to just kind of do the things I do every day, and these guys are like, oh wow, that's so awesome, oh here, can you do that again? And uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to propose that we just make it a lifetime project of the Ranchu movie so they can just keep coming and keep filming me for time immemorial is what my, my preference would be with that. Okay, so as of um, Thursday, I just purchased airline tickets to Japan this fall. The film crew is going to be following me oh, wow. to the All Japan Ranchu show, and that is going to be part of the story of the documentary they're putting together. I am extremely excited to visit Japan for the first time and attend All Japan Ranchu show. I am really, really excited to have already been invited to visit three different farms of famous breeders. I'm going to have opportunities to purchase Ranchu and bring back some new lines for all of us in the United States to enjoy. I am looking forward to learning a ton of information, both by asking questions and also observing the way they do it. And visiting multiple farms is going to give me a heightened perspective on how different uh, breeders are accomplishing their goals in Ranchu. And so this is really a uh, culmination of life type of goals. Um, uh, you know, in retrospect, yes, maybe it would have been nice to have gone to Japan uh, earlier to learn, but also I'm completely satisfied with uh, going with uh, maybe a heightened eye for what I'm looking for, because I'm bringing, you know, a little bit more skill to the trip. Maybe I will see things differently and ask different questions than maybe I would have uh, five or ten years ago, so I'm just uh, really excited to uh, to get to bring a heightened level of Ranchu back to the United States after this trip. And uh, then, then this is the uh, conclusion of my presentation. This is my greenhouse as of Thursday before I came up for the trip. So uh, instead of doing tomato plants this year, I'm trying to grow the uh, 12 foot tall giant sunflowers I'm wanting to have lining the whole center of the greenhouse and uh, yeah, still utilizing just the whole mix of ponds, but uh, really encourage people with an interest in Ranchu to pursue the purpose built ponds because those are really uh, what the ranch you were loving. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you uh, being here today. Uh, any questions at all? Do you see, uh, do you like the blue liner as far as the black? Is there any preference in that? Oh, well, it's interesting because when the, ron when the baby ranchu are in the black <laughs> liner, they turn darker. And when I transfer them into the blue liner, they instantly, well, I mean, within hours, their color lightens. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure physiologically what that means for the growth of the ranchu or whatnot. Um, 
The blue is much easier to see them. Um, even with the adult Ranchu, with the brilliant red and white and yellow <laughs> colors of the adult Ranchu, they seem to be more beautiful uh, behind the blue. Um, the black liner uh, was less expensive. Um, so I would say it's kind of a personal preference, but uh, blue is really traditional for the formed fiberglass and plastic uh, ponds that are available in Asia, so that's one reason why I really appreciate the blue. Well, I want to hear your thoughts on maintaining a breeding group and always doing just gaggle spawns or trying to do individual pairs and keeping track of all those. Right, so I keep my breeders in a huge group. Um, this year I've had 18 or 20 breeders in a single group in that huge 6x12 pond. Even though out of that group there's only a few that I am really, really looking to take eggs from. Um, but I keep them in that large group for just a pool of hormones and activity. So uh, females and males that I uh, might not be wanting to use as breeders, but I know are uh, very fertile and very active breeders. I will use those in the group to help trigger the rest of the group. Um, then, uh, typically the day or two before the spawns start to happen, I can see heightened activity levels in the pond the chasing starting to happen, everything kind of just becomes a buzz in there. So I know that that marks the time when I need to set my alarm for early in the morning to get right out there, right around sunrise. I will then check the different females and when I find one or that is one of the ones that I know I want to take eggs from, I will then take the female and males that I'm wanting to use and do the hand spawning into the bowl and to catch them on the, uh, the eggs on the, that fake grass. I'm also careful to, uh, I don't take water, I don't fill the bowl, the spawning bowl is not filled out of the pond where the fish are because I don't want milt from random males in that bowl so by you are chance. specific pairs and keeping extraordinarily specific pairing for male. I select the male and the female, hand spawn them into that bowl, and then uh, this year I've taken six spawns and stuff started to get so crazy with the pairings that I've now started uh, uh, taking a photo of the exact male and female and I make a little uh, index card out of that that I keep in a Ziploc baggie and uh, stick it to the pond with the eggs and then the fry and now the baby ranchu. So I'm trying to help myself out by keeping really close track of exactly who the father and mother of each spawn is. So yes, I'm, keep, I'm choosing the, the parents, making sure that only eggs and milt from those two are in the spawning bowl, and then keeping a photographic record that is tracked with the babies as they grow. Any other questions at all? Let me just make some points to support what you've said. The various ranchu kind of which Kangyo Kai is over 120, Kenkai Takashi's group is about 100 now. And basically, the group is around their sensei, and the group breeds fish from the sensei. So you find that the groups have slightly different styles because they've been derived over a long period of time from the sensei's lines. So you'll see this very much when you go to the show. And also, as you said, I like, I, I don't particularly care to TVR and SVR because living in the Orient for so long, everything is looked at 
from above. But the misconception that the fish are only judged from the top is totally untrue. The most important thing is the way the Ranchu moves. And it's supposed to move like a small recipe. <laughs> yes. And you'll see that when you see them all in the same pool. You'll see some that will catch your eyes right away. This guy's that strong movement. And the others that don't have as good a tail, so they'll be swishing a little bit. But after the selection is made from the top, they then go to the next level, and then they're turned on the side to check all these key points. And the final, but not really major importance, is to turn it over and look at the angles to see if there's one or two. And some that have won the top prize have had only one angle. So it's not critical, but the movement is, is extremely important. Well, and that's a great point about the different clubs in Japan um, uh, accentuating different features. I think that speaks to the art. You know, each artist or each sculptor is going to have a different style or a different thing they appreciate. And so, you know, some clubs may focus on an extremely robust head. Um, other clubs may be more uh, about the, the tail and the peduncle. And, uh, so just because you're seeing a ranchu that does not have the giant buffalo head, that does not mean that that is an inferior ranchu in any way because it has to do with what those breeders and what that uh, club is uh, striving for. And that's when we uh, get to express our own artistic uh, preferences in the ranchu. <laughs> Thank you, Neil, for that. I appreciate that very much. Anything else at all? Well, thank you all so much. Thanks, I appreciate yeah. your attention. <laughs> so about 25 minutes with Joshua McWilliams.